The scripture lesson is taken from John 14, verses 1 through 14. Let us begin. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip? and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Good morning. All right, so we have Scarlett and Jeremiah and Benjamin and James. All right, thank you. I have been waiting to see you because I know your names now. And Grace and Eliana and Violet. Violet, I knew that. How's everybody this morning? Good? Okay. So we just heard a story. Jesus is talking with his friends, and he's just told them that he's going to be, you know, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be, he's going to be killed, right? He's going to, how did Jesus die on the cross, right? I'm sorry, I answered the question. You know the answer. Uh, hey, Teresa. Um, and, and they're obviously concerned. Like, what? What are you talking about? And he says, hey, um, don't, don't worry. I'm going ahead of you, and I, where I'm going, um, I'm going to, there are many dwelling places in, in my father's house, right? And I'm going ahead of you, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, I, I use this sermon a lot when I do, when I do funerals, because Jesus, the, the, what he's saying, going ahead of you to prepare a room for you. He's talking about his death, but he's using the language of weddings, which is a celebration, right? Weddings, there's, you know, there's a wedding ceremony and there's a big party and it's a big celebration of love, right? Um, I was back in Jesus's day. I don't know as, as much as celebration of love as it was because there was all these arranged marriages, but we don't need to go there. Anyway, To get engaged back in Jesus' day, they would have an engagement party. And the would-be groom would offer a cup of wine to the would-be bride. And if she took a drink from it, she would be accepting, she'd be saying, I will marry you. Right? But if she said, "Mm -mm, I don't want it, then the wedding would be off. Right? And her parents would be very, very mad at her 
because they had done a lot of planning to arrange that marriage, right? But anyway, so that part of the wedding, so the engagement party was the groom would offer the bride a cup, and she, if she drank it, they would get married, and if they, if they didn't, then no. And they'd have to wait a year. There would always be a year in between. But in the meantime, if she said yes, he would go back to his father's house and build on a room to that house for them to live in. And that's where, they would, that, that's where they would live and raise their family and have a family and raise it there. Okay? Make sense? So Jesus is telling them that uh, when he's talking about his death, I'm going ahead of you and I'm going to you know, uh, build a room for you and then take you to be where I am. And by the way, and when the groom would finish the, the room, he would go back and everybody would know about it, right? But he would go back to the bride's house, who she was living in her father's house, and she would have a candle in the window so he could find her, right? You know, and, but everybody knew it was coming. And then people would follow behind like a big parade of people. And then they would go back to the father's house and there would be a big wedding. Lots of food, it would last forever, right? So when Jesus is talking about his death, he's talking about a celebration, of coming together, like you don't have to be afraid, right? There's going to be a big reunion. It's going to be a a celebration. There's going to be a lot of love, right? We too, because of Jesus, we don't have to be afraid of death. We, because we know we're going to be with God and we're going to be with our loved ones. And, uh, and a lot of people, um, it's human nature to, to, to be afraid of things that you don't, that you that you're not sure about. It's human nature. And one of those things is to be afraid of. But Jesus doesn't want us to live in fear. He wants to live in, in confidence that, um, that we're always going to be with God. I'm afraid. Does that make sense? Thank you. All right. So um, you all, in a second, are going to make like a you're going to make a little, uh, like a parade, like you're going back to the house uh, when you go off to Sunday school. Uh, but later you're going to come back and we're going to have communion together. The, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper where we are reminded of Jesus' death and his resur- but more importantly, his resurrection and the fact that he's always with us in this life and in the life to come. Let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Gracious God, thank you for a joyful image of never being separated from you, that you go ahead of us, that you will uh, come back for us, that we are always on your heart and in your mind. This gives us a great sense of peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture comes from Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. Um, I was thinking, I didn't want it to be the, the stoning of Stephen. I didn't want to be the, the, for the kids. So I'm preaching on the John passage, but I uh, left this one for a second so that I didn't have to go over the stoning of Stephen with the kids. Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let's begin with a blessing from Jan Richardson. Jan is an artist, writer, uh, United Methodist Church pastor. And because, and because I read the copyright permissions, you can find her work at janrichardson.com. And uh, 
if I had known I was going to use this in my sermon, it would have been put in the bulletin, but I didn't, so there you go. This is called Blessing with Many Rooms. As you step inside this blessing, we wish to tell you it is large enough for you to lie down in. Or you can curl up in this blessing with a cup of tea and a good book beside the window, here just behind you, that faces east. Likewise, it is true that you might not have paused long enough to notice that this blessing is big enough for a table, quite a sizable one, can be accommodated where your guests will want to linger far into the night. And if they desire to stay, you will find that through this door, you did not see it before, there are rooms in plenty where they can lay their heads and stretch out with abandon in their dreaming sleep. One room, many rooms, in this blessing, it is all the same. The point is that there is space enough, enough to make a life, a home, enough to make a world, enough to make your way toward the one who has made this way for you. In researching this passage, everyone that I read or listened to focused in on or gets stuck on the baggage that we have laid on the verse where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The church has used these words to erect walls or stone fences over which we lob bombs of exclusion or seeds of fear, but I preached on that last week and we're not going there this morning. I'm acknowledging that these words have been used to exclude, but that's not how Jesus meant them. Jesus was talking to his disciples, his best friends, trying to console them and comfort them. On that night, in that passage where we read read from John, Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, predicted his betrayal, death, and resurrection, and Peter's denial, and the disciples are frightened and confused. And Jesus tries to assure them that they will always be together no matter what, connected no matter what, no matter where he is, for he has shown them the way. Early Christians were called followers of the way. Jesus is the way. He speaks the truth that leads to life. If you want to know intimacy with God, follow Jesus' way. It leads to, to life, and not just in the next life, but in this life, especially in this life. If we take Jesus seriously it, and his way seriously, it is the hope of the world. Take forgiveness. As in our Acts passage and the stoning of Stephen, and Stephen was the church's first martyr. I had this epiphany in the car on the way here on Friday morning. Why did they put these two passages together? And it's because, G- because Stephen was following the way. He was imitating the way of Christ. Did you catch it? Jesus said from the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Stephen here says, while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. Stephen was following the way of Christ. The way of Christ does not seek revenge. The way of Christ loves one's enemies and prays for those who persecute them. And in that freedom from bitterness and anger, we know abundant life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When we experience people acting in the way of Jesus, God rejoices, and so should we. I, wa- I watch very few shows on television, so, and, and, I, and I talked about Ted Lasso this week, but you're getting another Ted Lasso example. Um, and I also need to say, I've seen, I've seen uh, pastors lament, because I have you know, a ton of 
pastor friends on on uh, Facebook lament. They're like they would really love to show this to their to their like their youth groups, but the language and 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 the sex is tough. And and this um, the same ex, you know, I had one of the episodes where I'm like, what that what does that mean? And my son was like, don't look that up. Don't ask me after the service. I won't tell you. I won't tell you what it is. But it was one of those. I remember my mother going, oh, isn't it so sweet? And our children are protecting us, you know. And I had that moment this week. But anyway, there's a lot of good. But I'm warning you, if you do turn into, tune into Ted Lasso, you have to be prepared. Anyway, so in this episode, and I'm behind a week. Not this week, but last week. Sam is a player from Nigeria and he has opened a restaurant and he's taken a stand against an official of the, the British government uh, because they're being closed to some refugees from Nigeria. And by taking a stand on social media, people break into his restaurant and you know, throw stones through the door, through the glass door, and they enter in and they try to destroy everything and there's gra graffiti on the walls and he's absolutely distraught. Enter his father. And his, after listening to his son's pain, they have this conversation. And his dad says to him, anger will only weaken you. But if you really want to tick off the people who did this, Forgive them. Sam says, what? And the dad says, forgive them. And then he says, big whoop. He did it a lot better than I do. And, and, and Sam goes, what, big whoop? And he goes, no, big whoop. I think we should all do that. He says, my son, listen to me. Don't fight back. Fight forward. And Sam laughs and says, thank you, Daddy. And I listen to that and I go, oh my gosh, there has to be a Christian on that writing staff, right? Because that's the way of Jesus. And the people who have found the way of forgiveness, you know, make Jesus, you, you got to think, make Jesus and the triune God just do cartwheels. Don't you think? Because they have found the way to abundant life. And I am grateful for all the covert teaching of Jesus that happens in the culture. You know, it kills me. Sometimes, you know, somebody in my family will come to me, I just saw this or I just read this. And it's like, you know, and, you know, like, have you listened to this? Have you, do you, is, this is wonderful. And I'm like, I preach that all the time. But they didn't hear it in the way that I presented it. But they heard it in this other way. And I think, oh, what can I do? But praise God, because God is so infinitely creative in the way that God pursues us to find the way. And I was thinking on the, on the way here this morning, I wasn't going to tell the story, but when I, was a, when I was a teenager, I thought, you know, with all my sins, you know, God just me, must be sick of me, and I wouldn't read my Bible, and I wouldn't pray, and uh, somebody gave me a Christian romance novel, but I would read that. And in that, one of the stories was the story of Jesus looking for the lost sheep. And I knew, I knew that was God telling me, you know, kiddo, there's nothing that you can do that will make me stop loving you and I will pursue you forever. That's, that's the character of our God. And God is infinitely creative in how God wants us to hear the, and receive the message. If we are living in the way we, we encounter kindred spirits and we celebrate them, we celebrate the teachings of Christ as we see them lived out. Love, grace, forgiveness. We celebrate abundant life. And, of course, we seek to model what we've been taught, what we have learned as we understand it. The way of Jesus is not an intellectual assertion. It is a way of life that we will not do perfectly. But we tell, so, we tell people so much more about what we believe by our actions than by our words. And we will not always model it well. Like Philip, we will question or be clueless. Like Peter, we will screw up. Like John, hopefully, we will all know ourselves to be beloved. That's where we begin and end. That's where we make our bed in the room 
dwelling with Jesus. Jesus promises to live in us, to live with us, to live through us, despite us and because of us. Elizabeth Johnson, Lutheran pastor, New Testament scholar, and missionary in Cameroon writes, Jesus promises to be with us through the power of the Spirit, to work in and through us to accomplish his purposes in the world. This does not necessarily happen in easily visible, spectacular ways. Yet whenever there is healing, reconciling, life-giving work happening, this is the work of God. Wherever there is life in abundance, this is Jesus' presence in our midst. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's art, who has made him known. That's John 1, verse 18. Jesus has made known to us the heart of God, and he has entrusted this mission of making known to us. And then she asks, where might we see Jesus' work and presence in our midst? How might we show others the heart of God? And I think that's a lovely question, a lovely way of putting it. Our job is to show others the heart of God, which is grace, which is love, which is forgiveness. Jesus begins this discourse with, do not let your hearts be troubled. You're going to go through a rough time. It's not going to be easy. But I have shown you the way that leads to life. In the spirit of Jesus and Stephen, I googled extraordinary stories, you know, in my, my search was extraordinary stories of forgiveness. And I read many, but they all boil down to something like this. Somebody does something to someone else and it's tragic, and the person did it either on purpose or by mistake. But at some point, the victim of this tragedy decides that they're going to put down the anger and embrace forgiveness so that they can know newness of life and the person who harmed them can know newness of life as well. This is the way, is it not? Suffering, death, and resurrection, again and again and again. Suffering, dying to the old self, or dying to the anger, resurrecting forgiveness and freedom in our hearts and in our minds. I have a story in my own life of harboring anger for a very, very long time and finally making the decision to to lay it down. I can't tell you the story because it's too tender, but I can affirm that choosing the way of Christ is the way of peace. But I also have to tell you it's a continual letting go because if you fed yourself a diet of anger and bitterness for a very long time, you get used to it. And so you'll pick it up and then you'll realize, no, you need to let it go. And that's, that's real. It's a, (laughs) it's a, it's a picking up and letting go and a picking up and letting go to finally that moment or that place where you really truly able to let it go once and for all, for all. And that you do arrive in that place, but it is a process. to choose to dwell in him and with him, with all my humanity, with all your humanity, is the best decision that we can make, and we make it again and again and again. I thought I would bookend with some of Jan Richardson's words. As you step inside this blessing, we wish to tell you it is large enough for you to lie down in There is space, enough to make a life, a home, enough to make a world, enough to make your your way toward the one who has made this way for you. May it be so, in Jesus' name, amen.